Hello, it's Thursday, November 3rd, 2016 at noon Eastern time, and this is a special edition of Higher Ed Live. I'm your host, Andrea Boyle Tippett from the University of Delaware, where the leaves are still miraculously on the trees, and I am bleary-eyed from watching an even more mir miraculous event, watching the world Cu uh, the Cubs win the World Series last night. So during today's broad broadcast, we're discussing purpose-driven social media. So you and the audience undoubtedly devote many hours to crafting communications plans to reach your various constituents. Then you carefully put those into action, draft press releases, alumni magazine stories, PSAs, videos, all sorts of media. But do your plans include social components? And if so, have you given them the same thought, consideration, and purpose-driven oversight as the other more traditional elements? Have you considered, for instance, social-only outreach? Maybe you should. Today, we are going to explore some case studies and dig into insights with a leader in the field. Higher Education Special Edition is part of the Higher Education Live Network, offering viewers direct access to the best and brightest minds in education. Live broadcasts allow viewers to share knowledge and participate in discussions around the most important issues in our industry. This episode will be a Q&A session, and we encourage you to submit your questions and the hashtag for that is higher ed live. So hashtag higher ed live to send in your questions. Today's live viewing experience is powered by Maestro, the premier marketing tech platform for broadcasters. All episodes of higher ed live are free and accessible in the video archives at higheredlive.com and in podcast form on iTunes. This episode in particular is made possible by PRSA's Counselors to Higher Education Professional Interest Section. Counselors to Higher Ed provides PR professionals working in colleges and universities with a few things. Publications, networking, and insights into the best ways to promote the value, power, and appropriate role of communications and marketing functions within institutions of higher ed. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a marketing and communications firm that works with educational institutions on branding, strategy, web design, and more. So now that we've done some of our housekeeping, let's jump into it. Joining us today is Nikki Sundstrom. Nikki is Director of Social Media at the University of Michigan. Thanks for being here, Nikki. Of course, thanks for having me. Nikki has been with UM for the past two years, and in that time, she has transformed UM Social into a pillar of global best practices among higher education peers and industry professionals. Her collaborative and goal-oriented methods have expanded the impact and understanding of online communications universally and cultivated audiences. UM now plays in the top 10 on every major social media network, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> Nikki is a recognized leader in the development and evaluation of emerging communication strategies for high performance and goal-oriented results. Prior to assuming her current role, Nikki developed and coordinated the state of Michigan's statewide social media footprint. By the end of her tenure, Michigan ranked third nationally in engaging government communications methods and she was responsible for managing daily interactions with an external audience of 6 million and an internal one of more than 46,000 state employees. So Nikki, let's start with problems and then move on to solutions. What would you say are the most common mistakes you see universities and colleges making when it comes to social media? You know, I think that one of the things that still kind of plagues the social media space is a lack of overarching strategy. And it's not unique within higher education. It's something that I've seen kind of in every business or organization I've ever interacted with. And so first and foremost, and we'll discuss this a little more as we go on, but making sure that social is a part of the, the conversation at the, the start. Um, we have a, a a large theme that I've written on the wall here um, that social media is not a solution it's a tool and I truly believe that it is just the latest iteration of communications work um, you know we started with billboards we moved into TV advertising and now we're into tweeting um, it will be something new and so we need to continue to evolve and we need to make sure that whatever that message is that we're putting into these social spaces is aligned with the overarching goals and objectives of our organization and so some of the things that I see frequently um, that we try to kind of stray away from here or that we purposefully don't do in order to have high yielding success is that we make sure all of our messages are on brand. Everything, you know, is unique 
content to us. Um, we always have the same consistent tone and personality to our content. And that, at the end of the day, means that some things aren't befitting of our, our channels, and that's okay. Um, we would never interact on something that's not, as we would call it, in our swim lane. And that elevates the level of conversation that we're allowed to have. And it really speaks to the demographics that we target because they expect a certain sort of gravitas from the University of Michigan. Um, and then we make sure that they get what they've come here to receive. Okay. How would you describe that tone? What would you say encapsulates the tone that you work with? Sure. So there was a, there's a very popular concept here at the University of Michigan that, you know, not attending here, um, kind of being bipartisan to any of the rivalries that are in the University of Michigan world. When I came here, I also had some learning to do about the mantras that the school has. And one of them is that they are the leaders and best. And adopting that mentality and really kind of putting ourselves on the forefront to be groundbreaking and whether, you know, it's social media um, outreach or if it is cancer research or if it is, you know, changing the world's um, perception of, of poverty and, and how we can shape the diversity conversation. All of those things we try to be on the forefront of, and we try to really implement strategies that have not been done anywhere else. Um, the University of Michigan is, is very frequently ranked as the number one public institution in the world. And so taking on that sort of level of credence and applying it into our social media is, is exactly what we do. Now we have other accounts um, that are subsidiaries of the University of Michigan. We have a, a 1,065 total accounts that my office oversees. And all of those represent the official brand in some way, shape, or form. Each of them can have a more unique personality because they're not speaking on behalf of that overarching mission. Um, our Michigan Dining Hall Twitter account, for example, gets to have all of the, the, the food kind of fun and the quirky conversations. And one of the examples I always love to share is that um, actually I ended up hiring this individual as an intern, but he over um, did a, a takeover of our UMish students Twitter account, which is a Twitter account that specifically changes hands to a different student every Sunday, and it allows them to be the voice of the community. And the UMish students Twitter account actually is larger than any individual school or organizational account. So it's very impactful. It's followed by a lot of really key people because I love to see that college type experience. And so Peter, that's in my office, um, took over that account and started this platform for advocacy for deep fried pickles in the dining halls. Um, and it started off in jest and it was a lot of fun, but our Michigan dining hall account actually started to interact with him and said, okay, if you can get 200 retweets, you know, we'll bring it in. And then one of our dietary um, staff and one of our nutritionists were kind of hopping in and they're like, are you sure you want deep fried? We could bake them. And it became this very comical conversation that we couldn't have on the UMich account, but was unique to that audience that the students loved. Um, he did get those 200 retweets. We did have a deep fried pickle day, and then it landed him a job. And so he um, <laughs> has been with our office for a little over a year now, and we capt um, captivated that kind of influencer persona that he had um, established, and we turned him into our uh, UM Social Try Guy and created a YouTube series around Peter in which we send him out throughout campus to do fun, quirky things and have great experiences like driving a Zamboni, um, but at the same time, we can also showcase the different elements of campus and educate our student body on things that are taking place right here in Ann Arbor. That's fantastic. I probably think it probably took him, what, like an hour to get 200 retweets for fried pickles? It was kind of crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so um, when you're approaching planning, you said to make sure that social is at the table, which I entirely agree with. Mm -hmm. What do you do in that planning? Um, someone comes to you and says, we have this initiative and we want it on social. And given that it fits with your brand strategy, where do you go from there? 
you know, we're kind of unique in the fact, um, and I, I think some know this. So the University of Michigan was the first organization to establish a senior staff position that is the director of social media, the role that I hold. And because of that forward thinking, what it did was put me at the same table as the director of public affairs, the director of news, um, and, you know, the chief of staff for the entire university. And so social has its foot in the door from the beginning. And we're very, very fortunate in that space because that's one of the things that I advocate for everywhere and now I'm able to serve as an ambassador for all of our individual schools and colleges to make sure that their social media staff or director of communications is there on the forefront as well because when we're a part of that original toolbox then we can cut down on those conversations where someone walks through my door and says oh, I have an event tomorrow I need a hashtag which just always makes my skin crawl because again, social is not a solution, right? It's not going to necessarily drive butts and seats unless you put the plan and the strategy in place weeks and months in advance to actually execute it properly. Um, and a lot of the advocacy around that um, with the social leadership of 50 that I've built here at our institution is outlined in our policy and our guidelines and the different case studies and stuff that we put out. You know, if you want real results, here's how it happens. And so in the case that we are doing some sort of planning, we have templates and um, different strategic consultation sessions where someone will come in and kind of map out a concept. We talk to them about what their target demographic is, whether that be appropriate for a Snapchat story or if it's a collaborative, more robust shared campaign. You know, perhaps it's a, a series in our Wolverines of Ann Arbor um, campaign, which is similar to Humans of New York, where we give a more personal sort of feel, um, a personal testimonial or story of an individual. Um, maybe it is a YouTube video or perhaps it's just a Facebook post that links to a different you know, blog that's already taking place. All of it is unique and all of it is customized and we make sure that if there's any assets that need to be created on the forefront that those are done so in a way that will perform best on those platforms and then we kind of package it all together and then I have the ability to share that forth and say okay here's what we're running with right now of course we're gearing up for election day and so we want to make sure that the messages are both good for our public policy students but also good for our student body as a whole and so putting those things into place and making sure that we know who's going to be where and where those messages will be disseminated and then who we're asking to be an influencer and share those or advocate on our behalf, making sure that's everyone from a student um, government leader to an executive officer. Um, that's kind of how we roll everything out. Sure. Can you give a specific example beyond the election, maybe one that's worked in the past of a yeah. proactive social campaign? Yeah, certainly. So in April of this year, um, April being Sexual Assault Awareness Month and obviously being a, a problem that's plaguing campus cultures universally, um, we really wanted to see whether or not we could leverage social media to have a more robust dialogue. And so we did a couple of things in the pre-planning process months in advance of this initiative in partnership with organizations on campus that already provide things like sexual assault awareness, um, support resources with our Division of Public Safety and Security to encourage reporting, you know, really impactful things that people need to know, but a conversation that's very challenging to have in, in many, many spaces. And so that, thing, um, that campaign rolled out in a variety of ways. We leveraged the Wolverines of Ann Arbor series, as I indicated. Um, you know, we had an actual sexual assault awareness survivor. Um, we did not show their face, but we did tell their story, right? We made sure that within our Snapchat story, which is more of a, a private venue for, for students and young adults, that we gave that message and said, you know what, we believe you, and it's important for you to come forward on these issues. Um, we want to make sure that you have the right resources and that you know the ways in which to reach out to others or report if you see something, right? Because it's not always just the person that's been victimized. It might be a witness to that type of event. Um, we did an Instagram series in which we had um, individuals, again, not showing the face, hold a series of different signs that had impactful messaging on it and then dialogues that were contained in the contents that went along with that. Um, we had 
a lot of tweets, different tweets that pushed out resources, that pushed out information, um, that just kind of kept that messaging going. And then we continue to work with that organization because I, I truly believe this is not a, a conversation that we can only have during a month that's been dedicated to it, to say, okay, on a regular basis, how can we continue to get these things out so that we're being proactive rather than reactive when something like that happens? Um, and it had great success. I mean, we really saw a lot of people kind of snap at us and say, you know, thank you. Um, I didn't know that resource was available. In the same uh, token, I think a lot of people in higher education took a, a look right before the uh, back to school fall session for us in which we put out a Snapchat story about Run, Hide, Fight in partnership with our um, Department of Public Safety and Security. And that's about active shooter training, um, a, a very challenging and difficult conversation, but something that's important to prep our students and our staff and our faculty. I'm sorry, I can't hear Nikki at the moment. I'm not sure what's what has happened there. You may be muted for some reason. I am really sorry about this. So just give us a second and see. We'll see if we can resolve this issue. Um, I'm not absolutely. She, Nikki says she can't get off mute, unfortunately. Um, so let's just hold on one second. Please bear with us for our technical difficulties. I feel like I should be a full screen graphic that just says technical difficulties right now. <laughs> so we're just going to have to pause for a minute and get um, Nikki back on the line. It looks like she actually is out, logged off for the moment. Um, and there she is back on the line. So let's see if we can hear her now. Nikki, I can hear you. Yay! Yeah, I refreshed <laughs> the page and that seemed to do it. I'm not entirely certain what happened. The miracles of technology. Okay. All right. Somebody um, tell me where they lost me then. So you were talking about you were talking about um, the results of the sexual assault and then other uh, other various programs. So I won't have you kind of go back over that. But Perfect. when you were talking, I was thinking about how great some of these elements are. And you said, you know, Wolverines of Ann Arbor is a playoff of Humans in, of New York, but from what I saw of your social content, um, some of it's entirely original, some of it may be adapted from other ideas. Where do you all get your ideas? How do you hash them out? Um, I know you have a team. Is it exclusively your team? How do you work with the, the colleges and schools and units? Yeah. So it kind of depends. Um, some of the campaigns come from outside sources. Uh, the individual schools and colleges, one of the first things that I did when I got here was created a leadership council. And so I have one individual within each school and college or major organization um, that is a part of that leadership council. And we meet on a bi-monthly basis and some of us interact on a bi-weekly basis um, depending on the size of the account. So something like our um, very massive health system, our our, um, athletics department you know we need more regular check-ins to talk about daily content or, or big campaigns or game days that are happening um, from there a lot of the overarching initiatives come from my central team so I have two full-time staff people and then I also have five student interns and we are always kind of talking about what the next big thing could be or what you know we could dream up that would be fantastic the Wolverines of Ann Arbor campaign came from a student project that one of our interns actually brought to us during the interview process. Um, other things, one of the fun things I always kind of say to my staff when we're planning out our, our yearly objectives and goals is that I want them to come up with one cool thing, something that I'd never think of, right? So bring me, bring me this amazing idea that may just be shooting for the stars and let's see how we can make it actually feasible for our office. Um, one of the cool things that we did was actually we brought in a vending machine that when you tweeted at it, it cashed out prizes. And um, that, you know, is a huge <laughs> success. We partnered with individual um, schools and organizations and they helped provide swag for it. We moved it over the course of the six, uh, six weeks that we had it to multiple locations across campus. 
people took selfies with it. We did a nice little packaging video at the end. Um, our campaigns are really all our thematic days of content, which you can find out more about on our website, um, are all shaped around the overarching goals of the university and the pillars of which we represent. So, you know, today obviously is Throwback Thursday, um, history, and as we gear up for our um, bicentennial next year, obviously showcasing the last 200 years of our university is something that's very important to our heritage and the impact that we've had globally. And so we're making sure that today, for example, our Bentley Historical Library is teeing up a picture from the early 1900s of people standing in line to vote, um, which makes perfect sense for us then to pair the messaging with the, the people get out and, and exercise their civic duty come Tuesday. Great. So we have some questions coming in from Twitter. I'm oh. sorry I don't have the handles here of who the okay. people are, but thank you Twitter users for sending us questions. <laughs> um, one is how do you leverage your social media ambassadors potentially? Um, I take social media ambassadors to mean what it means here at Delaware, which is that we have about 100 students who are in a program and, and they actually contribute content. Um, I know other people might take ambassadors to just mean um, different individuals in different units. Um, students, as you said, you know, who might take over um, Twitter for a week or, um, you know, how do you how do you leverage them? So we don't have a formalized program, um, which I think kind of makes us unique in the fact that we haven't really identified a subset of influencers in which we point people to because we're very cognizant of the fact that we know people look to the University of Michigan, Michigan accounts for official um, information, right? It's kind of like the fact that our director of public affairs is the only person that talks to me news media, right? So the University of Michigan overarching accounts are held to a similar standard. Now, that is why we have the UMich Students Twitter account. It gives um, ambassadors or our student body, graduate students, incoming freshmen, the ability to kind of be the voice of the community. But they also um, sign a document, you know, because they are speaking on behalf of the brand in some way, shape, or form. And so they're not able to kind of pontificate on behalf of anything that they um, might soapbox on. Um, so there's some parameters in there. Now we do leverage personalities. I wouldn't necessarily call them ambassadors. Um, but on Tuesdays, for example, we have takeovers on our Snapchat account with our medical students. And that gives us a way to showcase kind of the very difficult world, right? We can tell health stories, but what it's like to be a medical school student. Um, we also will do on an individual basis different things where my staff go out and they'll provide more personality to show, you know, this is, well, Monday's a great example. So there was a haunted house on campus and it's Monday and you get to have a little bit of fun for Halloween. And so Sarah from my staff drew the short straw and had to go get, you know, scared. And um, <laughs> she, she was able to tell a little more fun, um, whimsical story about that. So it's kind of a case by case basis. Um, we want those stories to really resonate with the people that they're intended to reach, but we don't want to stray because then I'd just be continuously kind of training people, right, to, to speak on behalf of our organization. Another question from Twitter is on something you just touched on, your hospital system, your athletics department. Mm -hmm. How do you um, work closely with them, or I should say, how closely do you work with them? Because as you know, at many institutions, those two kinds of entities and some others can feel very siloed and very much like they're their own brand, they're their, their own like piece of the world, not associated with the university in some ways. Yeah, no, we're all best friends. Um, and <laughs> so that, you know, it's unique, I think, to the type of work that we do. And it's just relationships that I established very early on, because we are kind of a three pillar system, right? You've got the university, and then you have a world renowned um, medical system. And then you have just the behemoth that is M Michigan athletics. Um, and allowing us those are are two of the examples of people that serve on my leadership team that I meet with and we do um, Google Hangouts or we do phone calls on a bi-weekly basis. And so every other week, actually on opposite weeks, I'm checking in with Brian at Athletics and I'm checking in with Rich um, from the health system. And on a daily basis, they're either providing me content or telling me of issues 
or concerns or anything that might be forecasting or coming, we all share the same analytics tool that my office provides to them in order to get us all on the same page with notifications. So if something starts to trend in association to our brand or in their individual areas, um, I can start to triage that with public affairs and with public safety and security. Um, we truly run in tandem and that has allowed us a, a lot of leeway in making great social content. Great. Tools. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what tool you use and then go beyond that and, and how do you measure success with campaigns, et cetera? Yeah, sure. So right now, um, the tools that we have in place is actually the Meltwater um, Social Analytics, and that is a tool that we procured within probably the last six months. It was a newer tool that they were demoing that they wanted to offer to us. Um, I think that the the Meltwater tool for news has been around, you know, obviously for some time. People pull clips and different things like that. One of the things that I really found very appealing about it was the fact that um, they were going to give us lots of seats at the table, which is always, I think, a downfall of, excuse me, of social media tools is that they want to charge you per user. Um, and they were willing to work with us in, in that sense because we've created such a collaborative structure. It becomes kind of impossible to pay to get hundreds of users in for, you know, my social media budget. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I really liked about it is that it's very proactive in the fact that it allows for geofencing and that the analytics that it provides are unique to our brand. So we're not just keyword searching, it's actually um, evaluating the content and curating things in association to the University of Michigan, our specific influencers, the people that are, follow our accounts and their, it's weighting um, their reach, right? One of the the biggest problems I think that I encountered when I first got here um, and coming out of government and kind of knowing just how impactful social media could be um, and what a true social media firestorm looks like. I would get these things and say, oh, Nikki, this person's really upset online. And I'm like, they have two followers. Well, they created their account yesterday. Why are we wasting time on this? And I have to imagine people, every person in the audience has had that <laughs> same conversation. Really getting people to understand, like, here's the idiosyncrasies and here's the actual impact on our brand. And we're very fortunate in the fact that um, overall, we pretty much have a 24 hour burn cycle. Um, I've, I've talked with a lot of other universities about this when any sort of thing pops up. And we are very fortunate in that fact that, you know, short attention spans and social work in our favor. Um, but from there on out, we use that tool to say, okay, if anybody says words like gun, bomb, threat, attack, geofenced around our stadium, right, or geofenced on our campus, we'll get immediate alerts. Um, we had some alerts come in this past weekend related to news stories that started to show up um, that it determined were trending in relation to our brand that actually hadn't appeared yet in social. It was just a link that it was reading. Um, and that was able to help us change some of our content that we were going to be putting out over the course of the next week. Um, so very valuable for us. Most other things are in-platform tools. Um, we do a lot of things the old way, right? Which I guess isn't really that old. Mm -hmm. um, but just in conversations with ourselves and outlining best practices of things that we want to evaluate, we look a lot more at impact and engagement than we do whether or not it's increased our followers. Um, we're fortunate in the fact that we're big. We know that we have a lot of followers. So at the end of the day, what I want to see is that we actually educated somebody on something. I mean, we are a higher education institution. You didn't touch on, um, well, I guess you did. It, how do you kind of measure that piece? How do you measure the piece of if you um, if you educated someone on something? Yeah, so it can be in the form of a share or it can be in a form of an interaction or mm -hmm. general impact, right? So sometimes we see things like an Instagram takeover with a, um, a cancer research doctor and then I can say, okay, media calls came based off that because she was discussing her research. We can also say that there was an increase in donorship to her research associated with this campaign. Um, we can also say that she was contacted by eight of her peers across Across the nation and they said hey that is the coolest thing I've ever seen I really think you're doing a great job being proactive in public engagement and you know none of those that it may have also gotten 3,500 likes or 10,000 likes which is fantastic but more importantly we made an impact in that area and people actually walked away with some sort of value right 
So I, I have a question here from yeah. Jeremy Katzman on Twitter, and I'm going to add on to his question as well. Sure. He asks, how would you define your primary target audience for the main UM account? Is it prospective students, current students, et cetera? Um, and then I would piggyback on that and say, when you have identified, as I'm sure you have, your target audiences and on each platform, how do you um, create engaging content specific to that platform? So what are some universal tips on developing engaging content? Yeah, so I would actually say to Jeremy that it's both, but it's much, much more. Um, one of the interesting things that I was just speaking with someone about yesterday, when I was in government, everyone was a constituent. They were one target demographic. There was no differentiation. The nice thing about higher education is that there is a plethora of people that have identities within that constituent relationship. So they're alumni. They're young alumni, they're students, they're prospective students, they are people that have just been a Michigan Wolverine fan since birth, right? There's people that know a friend of a friend of a friend or absolutely hate us because they're an Ohio State fan. All of those people are our stakeholders and all of those people follow us on social media. Um, and the content that I derive and create for them, they may not love, they may not like, but at least they're learning something at the end of the day. And then the campaigns and the people that they target and the platforms in which they're um, disseminated, that's all unique to the target demographic. So if I want to reach somebody to create a tunnel of 200, 200 students on the Diag, um, for the president to run through, which is something that we've done, that goes into Snapchat, right? It certainly doesn't go on Facebook. If I want to have a, a robust dialogue with a um, research doctor and a cancer patient survivor um, that is now in our nursing school, um, we did that on Facebook Live. Right, so all of these different things, and I know where the people are and, and what I want to give them, we tailor that uniquely. Um, but our demographics are so robust on each platform that it's really hard to say that, you know, this is just Twitter or this is just Instagram. That I focus more on, more on age. Okay. Let's dig into one of the platforms, Snapchat. Mm -hmm. So um, we haven't mentioned it by name, but you do have a fantastic social media presence on your website and that is socialmedia.umich.edu and so I encourage everyone to go there not right now but go there after this is over and dig in um, I spent way too much time going down the rabbit hole there because it was also very important and like very um, great takeaways there one of the posts from the summer was about snap and it contained five tips for leveraging snapchat to its fullest potential while I do encourage everyone to read it after the fact, um, can you review some of those best practices for Snapchat? Because I feel like that's maybe the one platform that people don't know as much about. Yeah, certainly. So the University of Michigan um, started Snapchat very early, and it allowed us before it really, you know, hit top pi priority in many people's spaces to kind of test the water slowly and identify. And so we went from doing about a story a, a week in 2014 um, to 2015 hitting about a story a day. Um, and that has continued. Uh, Snapchat as a platform, we were very strategic in the fact that we wanted one account that represented the entire university. And so we have built a, a shared structure of that account that allows for things like the medical school takeover that, that I mentioned. Um, we align those different days with the priori priorities of our university and also the, the key initiatives that we want to make sure that we're maintaining our focusing like sexual assault awareness. Um, and so the, the five tips that are outlined in that, that blog post from, um, I believe, June or July of this summer um, was provide content that's visually appealing as well as informative, right? So it has to be a dynamic dialogue and a story. You're essentially creating a mini commercial. Um, and what's unique, I think, to our account and one of the things that UM Social sees themselves as both for the university is kind of a, a best practice in social media, but within higher education, making sure that we're educating our peers on what we're doing, which is all the case studies that you kind of mentioned that you started to go through. Um, I truly see that as one of my duties to provide to everyone else. Um, I think one that everyone loved was, of course, when we got hacked, and then we were very um, transparent about how that happened and what we did to, um, to move forward. And I think that shocked a lot of people, um, but, 
you know, what were we going to do? Say it didn't happen. It, it clearly <laughs> did. It was on ESPN for, for heaven's sake. So um, the other things with Snapchat that we do is make sure that everything is in alignment with the brand, right? So we want to use all of the different things that are available within the tool. Um, we don't do dog faces very often, but, you know, we do leverage Bitmoji. Um, that gave us a, a perfect opportunity to do a, a tutorial and to add a little bit of quirky personality. Um, I provided a, a document that I shared with you guys earlier that kind of outlines our brand standards for when people do um, takeovers of the account. Like, make sure that you're only using maize and blue or black and white. Um, make sure that you're always including a, a call to action or some of the 20-some geo filters that we have across campus. Um, just technical tips. And then because we upload all of these stories to YouTube and try to get them out so that other higher education institutions or even individual areas can um, use them from there, we um, ask them to kind of, here's how you need to screenshot your analytics and then move on from there. Um, we also, um, in, in those tips, um, one of them is about timeliness. So one of the biggest things that I think people learned when they started doing takeovers was that while a snap may be 10 seconds, um, putting together a complete story can take a whole hour um, because you are only doing the highlights. So you want to make sure that you prepare yourself properly. Um, and one of the things that you can find on our website is actually a storyboard template specifically for Snapchat. So when we sit down with different um, areas and they say, hey, we'd love to try a Snapchat story or I um, dispatch one of my five interns to go do a Snapchat story for someone, we make sure that we have in each little screen, you know, shots that are laid out almost like you would map out a television commercial or, or a PSA. Um, we also, you know, again, one of those things was the strategy behind it. We build bridges, not accounts. Um, particularly with Snapchat, with the limited analytics, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for everyone to have an individual account. Um, you know, we surpassed, well, Snapchat doesn't even provide an overarching analytic anymore for total volume of followers, unfortunately. So the last place that we dropped off in August, I believe, was just over 14 or 15,000. We know that that continues to grow, um, but I think it's pretty telling in the fact that even Snapchat doesn't provide that analytic anymore. Um, they want you know, you to see your individual views, which is something that we screenshot. Um, and then the best things in life are free. So the only thing, and I know later in our dialogue here, we have a question about um, paid social. About the only thing we pay for is, is geo filters. Um, we leveraged a lot of community geo filters in the beginning before they had to be paid. Um, but now the small dollar investment that's associated with a, a, a geo filter is a great way for our individual schools and organizations to kind of put a stamp on something. Um, it's a great way for us to interact with people during commencement. Um, and the analytics that they give us in that tool, you know, are valuable to say, here's how many people saw it. Here's how we can apply our branding. Um, and everybody, just the ephemeral nature of, of utilizing something like that is so popular right now that it really makes the most sense for our bang on our buck. Sure. So let's jump to that question about paid social. I know that a lot of brands, including universities, are seeing their, their organic reach go down because so many other people are paying for social. Why have you chosen not to do that? And if you can put yourself in the mindset of maybe an organization that doesn't have the reach of yours, mm -hmm. what might you suggest to them that they do consider paid social? You know, I definitely say that it has to be unique to the goals of the, the organization. And if you have the dollars associated with it, um, some of those problems can be solved with more dynamic, engaging content and not necessarily with dollars associated. What I see too much, I think, is people pay to boost a post that's really not that great anyways. Um, and so what was the return on your investment and what were you hoping to accomplish? Now, our health system um, does sometimes, particularly with videos that they're intending to go viral or hoping to reach media attention level, um, they'll throw a couple dollars behind it. And we'll see great success with that. Um, but with other things, you know, I've 
I've heard horror stories across campus of, of social media managers being approached and, and given a budget um, to boost a tweet to get a butt in a seat at a conference or a speaking event. And that never turns out well for anyone. Um, and at the end of the day, it's because there was a lack of strategy on the, on the forefront and a lack of understanding of what social actually can accomplish. Um, so I think that if you have a, a tangible outcome that you're trying to reach and the money to go with it, by all means, be my guest. It can cost you as little as $20, but I think you have to be realistic about the type of content that you're associating that money with and whether or not at the end of the day, it's really worth it for your organization. Sure. Uh, another question from Twitter, um, and, and there's actually two questions. The first one, they're basically the same, um, from Ta Tasha Attaway. Mm -hmm. And she says, how are you staffed to produce all of the graphics you need and to ensure that they adhere to brand standards? And earlier on, someone also asked the same question about how do you make sure clubs, departments, others, I mean, you mentioned something like a thousand different accounts. How do you make sure that they all stay on brand as well? Is that so go back to your meetings or? So that's part of that overarching um, leadership council that we laid out first. So some of the first things I did when I walked through the door here was created socialmedia.umich.edu, right? We needed a central hub where everyone could come and understand what our office functionality was and what they needed to know about social. Um, identifying and having those one-on-one -on -one relationships and creating that leadership council so that I have a point of contact because I'm certainly not a content expert for everything that happens at the University of Michigan, but if something comes in that's concerning about the Ginsburg Institute or sustainability, I need to know who to reach out to because those people come to the overarching brand account first. In the same token, that team then allows us to all be on the same page about branding, about content standards and expectations, about what it takes to justify or create an account, about when accounts need to come down and how to police them properly. Um, I, I see something in the chat here about rogue accounts as well. Um, we've really been able to cut down and streamline that number to 1,065 because of those efforts and getting everybody on the same page. Um, internally within my office, I have a graphic design intern. Um, both of my full-time staff also are skilled in graphic design. Um, and we have a brand website and then documents like the one that we just depicted that kind of lay out the overarching standards for both having the correct tone, the correct coloration, and the correct approach to social media. And all of those are given to social leadership and then it's their job to be ambassadors of those policy and guidelines to any subsidiary accounts that might fall within their individual school or organization. So, you know, Matt at our Literature, Arts, and Science School um, may also have accounts underneath him that are a subset that could represent a study program. And it's, you know, kind of a tiered effort, right? We have this overarching umbrella, and then we have all of this joint collaboration in which we work to unify our message. And when you created your guidelines, I know our team here has worked really closely with our general counsel's office. Mm -hmm. Is that the same on your end? That is very true, yes. So I was extremely fortunate. The policy that I wrote for the state of Michigan um, was blessed by our state attorney general. And so when I brought that um, with me in my pocket, it already kind of had some really high credence. And then I was That's able an unfair to, advantage, by the way. Right? I mean, it, the attorney general said it's okay. So um, we brought that, I brought that here with me, adapted it for the university and then our general counsel, you know, because we did have to make it very specific to our community. Um, but at least we kind of had some parameters. And so we're continuously we have a policy um, as I mentioned that our UMA student tweeters have to sign before they can get access and credential to the account and that goes through general counsel um, whenever we're talking about sharing user generated content we want to make sure that we have a, a policy for that and again those are all available on our website shifting gears let's talk about live because that seems like it's been or is bound to be on the list of the top buzzwords for 2016 when it comes <laughs> to this space Facebook's algorithm favors its live functionality. How much have you worked with Facebook Live? Um, and can you share a success story? Yeah, so we started kind of toying around with live um, in a multitude of ways over the course of the last year. And um, we actually 
wrote a blog post in July of this year, um, kind of evaluating what live was doing to the social world, um, particularly when a lot of really hot topics were taking place across the nation in which people were just kind of pulling out their phone and, you know, filming really controversial events. Um, in the same token, I was really very captivated by this series that, you know, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon had created in which they were only going live and they were doing like a chaser scene in which you could actually watch someone running and being chased by people to see whether or not they could catch them. Um, and I think that there's a ton more that live will do to television and, and viewership overall. Um, you know, Netflix individual series may not may not be live, but they're ephemeral TV content, which is kind of crazy. Um, and so we evaluated that. We did our homework on the front end. And then we actually changed um, and tested the waters with a series we've been running for nearly two years called You Miss Chat, which is a, a one-hour live Twitter dialogue in which we put together a robust panel of faculty experts, um, greater experts at large that could be from the federal government or a, a private industry or public institution that's not ours. Um, and they talk about something that is really very important in current day events, right? So we've done things like how social media was impact, impacting events that happened in Ferguson when that was all unfolding. Um, and those dialogues have always taken place um, on Twitter in 140 characters, and then we have storified them and created a record and a case study that people could learn from. We decided to test Facebook Live. Um, so two months ago now, we actually did one that I, I referenced earlier in which we took a, I believe it was an ovarian cancer doctor, um, and we brought in also a nursing student who survived cancer as a child here at the University of Michigan and is now enrolled, right? So very impactful dialogue. It could have been a still image. It could have been a blog post, but we put them in front of a camera on, on Facebook Live and saw excellent results. So I happened to pull the numbers and you can look these up on the website too, but um, we had 14,000 video views by 13,701 13, unique viewers in an hour. Not bad, right? Um, and it reached an estimated 111,000 people. You know, that's great. It, it was a great. It was it was must much watch TV for for a little bit of time. Now I still, especially when we're talking about shortened attention spans, um, I think that live needs to be used sparingly for very specific purposes. Um, we tested the waters with live again, and we've invested in technology and tools here in the office. Um, but before homecoming, there's like a big event on the Diag on campus, which is our central um, area, and we had lots of big name speakers and influencers and dance groups and all kinds of fun things. And so we live streamed that for our alumni around the world. And we saw a lot of views associated with that too. Now, an unforeseen circumstance of that was that Facebook identified some of the music that was playing in the background and then pulled our video. And now it's gone. Um, and so, you know, I think we're all still learning. Um, I think that it's worth the try, um, but needs to be used strategically. Would you suggest that people put a lot of thought into, again, storyboarding that, figuring out, I know on our, on our end, our digital team learned um, similarly at graduation. They, they tested it out beforehand and realized there was only Wi-Fi in certain parts of the stadium, and so you couldn't go beyond a certain spot. But I know um, from my days in live television that what looks live is not always as easy and seamless as it is it Very scenes true. on camera you know you have to have extra people behind the scenes all those sorts of things you yeah. kind of have crews to do that when you have yeah so it's really interesting um we've been i referenced our bicentennial earlier you know this is something that only happens every 200 years right so we're really trying to, to do it well <laughs> and we have all of these different um colloquia and events and you know influences are coming to do um guest lectures and everyone wants to know about live and i'm just thinking you know and, and challenging them would you actually want to watch this like would you sit there and watch a panel or does 
it make more sense to maybe stream it on YouTube, but not on Facebook? And, you know, we're, we're finding the correct avenues between these platforms to say, maybe this makes more sense. And then we do the highlights or the, the amp up or the really enthusiastic preamble on Facebook, but then the rest of it kind of gets archived and, and categorized onto YouTube, or we just record the whole thing and then make it a truncated video that's more engaging and we disseminate that at a later time. Um, all of those, again, are happening kind of on a case-by-case -case basis, but live definitely, as you referenced, is going to be a buzzword for some time to come. Sure. So just a reminder to the audience, we're going to be wrapping up the program soon, so if you have any lingering questions, please tweet those to hashtag higher ed live, or using the hashtag higher ed live. One other question that came through via Twitter was, what are your thoughts on the news unit or the university relations team, whatever you all call it, having a separate social presence from the university's official platform? Mm -hmm. So our news, our Michigan News Agency, um, which is a part of the same um, global communications office as myself, um, so my colleague, the director of Michigan News, they do operate a Twitter account and a Facebook page, um, and they're followed by a lot of journalists. Um, they have a smaller subset right, of demographic, but they're able to put out their news and their expert videos and their quotes and, you know, the still image that says, if you want to find out more about this hot topic, contact us. And that content performs well for them. And it works simultaneously with ours, where our accounts are more all encompassing, right? It's not just daily news. It's the pulse of kind of everything that's happening, the latest and the greatest, and some student things, and some hot topic things. Um, and we work together every single day to make sure that we're identifying those because some of those news things that are going to to bubble up very quickly, um, we want to help them elevate. Or I want to make sure that I'm reaching out to the president and he's tweeting about it as well. Um, you just never know. Now, that's not to say that for some other higher education institutions that may have a smaller demographic, that it doesn't make sense for them to be one in the same. I, I know some that do operate like that. And the thing that I think is unique about that is that some of them chose to make their central university account actually be labeled um, news. And that, I think, is selling yourself too short. Um, I think that you do need to have that overarching brand presence and then have news be a part of that or have news run right next to it. Um, but at the end of the day, when you're looking um, from a news aspect to get placements for faculty or staff or influencers, advocates into op-eds or into Conversation US or in, onto a television interview, that's not my forte and that's not something that it's going to be identifiable in the tweet an hour that we're putting out from the Central UMich account. Romana Sultana asks on Twitter, what types of content do you see with the highest um, engagement rates across any platforms, any and all platforms? So what gets the most engagement? Sure. So short videos tend to still play well into any and all platforms. So if you're looking for one type of content that will get the most bang for your buck everywhere, it's usually a customized, what we would call maybe a GIF, or it is a um, 15 to 60 second or less video. Um, and all of those, again, highlight something that we've created rather than just pushing out, you know, Beyonce or, or Taylor Swift or whatever the latest GIF is in association with something that you're already doing. I think those are a detractor. Um, and a lot of that content is created within our own office. Um, we will also take subsets of different stories and make them into shorter video clips that we can then promote to point people to a larger piece, right? If it's going to be a long form story and we know that it won't play well as a link on um, on Facebook, we'll do a little bit of a, a video that goes with it. Um, we started over a year ago something with in partnership with our news organization where they provide us every set, um, Saturday a video for Instagram. 
that runs through the top five to ten headlines in the news associated with the University of Michigan a week. And it gives us an opportunity to tell the Instagram demographic, like, hey, here's some actual hard-hitting news stories that you might want to find out more about. Um, and that helps us both kind of play off each other and, and drive traffic to each other, but um, also showcases content in a different way because it is a, a video platform and you know, news stories and, and press headlines may not always be the most coveted or engaging piece of content. Sure. So Andrew Landerheaney asked, do you utilize Periscope for the less lively live requests? What's Periscope? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> you know, it's funny because when Meerkat and then Periscope, you know, launched right away, um, we received a ton of phone calls and inquiries. What are you going to do with it? Um, and I kind of told everybody that we were going to wait until it necessitated strategy and use. And some of our smaller organizations have leveraged Periscope to go live. Um, we really have not. Um, we've had the opportunity to do it through YouTube where we have over 10,000 subscribers and it just made more sense for us than to kind of ad hoc throw up Periscope on our, our iPhones on Twitter and, and see who came in, if anybody. Um, we haven't had any great success stories out of our individual schools and colleges associated with it that would necessitate us to really focus on it, which is why we looked towards something more like Facebook Live. Another question from the Twitter stream is, do you have any great success stories in collaborating with alumni social media? Yeah, so we partner with the Alumni Association um, quite frequently to showcase different stories and to leverage what we would call an influencer within our network. Um, two years ago at commencement, we worked with both them and our Office of Development to create a bunch of um, opportunities for our alumni around the world to essentially say congratulations and go blue um, and to give tips and resources and accolades about the great accomplishment of graduating from the University of Michigan. And we showed that on the Jumbotron at um, commencement, which takes place in our big, um, big house. We also made sure that those were individual social media assets. Um, whenever a prominent speaker that's an alumni comes to campus, we'll do different pieces of social media content. Um, but they also run their own individual channels um, and that's that's okay right so they get to have um, more game day fun than we necessarily do sometimes and they get to cover a lot more um, individual events where somebody might be having a, a watch party for something and a bunch of small alumni groups have gotten together and we allow them to you know run with that content and then we populate things as they ask um, to kind of elevate it to that next level so one more question from Tasha, Tasha Attaway, and I think this is a great one. How do you determine what rises to the level of getting an individual social media account? And how does your office legislate that? Yes. So as I think everybody knows, in the world of higher education, um, policy is not a friendly word, which was uh, something I had to learn coming out of government where everyone loves a policy. Um, <laughs> and we do have essentially what we call an implementation guideline, which is soft term for policy. Um, and that actually dictates and outlines what justifies an account. And a lot of that is strategy and long-term goals, planning, and objectives. You know, can you have content for years to come? Does your core demographic live on this platform? Can you provide a Facebook post every day? Can you provide three to five tweets a day? Um, and that all comes through that overarching umbrella organization that I explained with the leadership org. So if my person from the Ford School tells me that an individual area within their school has justified an account and they've worked together to strategize and they're going to have checkpoints and analytics and they've got enough content to really thrive on their own, then I'm going to take Chris's recommendation and say, okay, I'll add them to the inventory. I trust your judgment. Now, in the same token, when something bubbles up 
to me and I just can't understand or possibly fathom why anybody would want to follow this account for a book or something like that. Um, then we reach out and we talk to that person and say, hey, did you talk to your, to your middleman, to your person on your social leadership council um, that kind of oversees your area before you had and launched this account? And sometimes it's a yes and sometimes it's a no. Um, and then we go through and we kind of work backwards. And those are always harder conversations, um, but we want to make sure that at the end of the day, if your goal is to reach people and educate them on the type of content that you have, you know, you're not talking to zero people. And that's usually what happens when you start a new social account. So, you know, what was your marketing plan to create that account and to get you a bunch of followers? And how are you collaborating with your traditional methods of communication to make sure that everybody's on the same page and following this account? And then, you know, is it just for a one day event or are you planning for the next five years? Um, so that's how we legislate that. Fantastic. So we're out of time for today. I want to thank you, Nikki Sundstrom from the University of Michigan for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Course. Thank you to everyone following on along um, online and sending in your great Twitter questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks as always to our program sponsor, PRSA's Counselors to Higher Education, as well as program sponsor, M. Stoner. We appreciate you joining us for this special edition of Higher Ed Live, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you.